My name is Moya McDear, like Anya said, and I'm really excited to be talking to you about imposter syndrome or imposter phenomenon today, especially in this building and in this room. Uh, for those of you who aren't in New York City, we're here at the Center for Computational Astrophysics. The last time I was in this building, and actually in this room, I was sitting in that seat where you're sitting, uh, I was here for the Gaia DR2 hack day and I left this building in tears, just like absolutely bawling because I felt like I was too stupid to be in this room. So to be back here talking about the very phenomenon that made me leave that day a little bit over a year ago is really powerful for me. Um, I, oh, that is bad. Can you turn off your microphones? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's so much better. All right, thank you. I'll tell you when you can turn them back on so we can do the discussions. Uh, but I first want to tell you a little bit about where I came from. Anya gave a really great introduction, uh, but there's a little bit more that I want to say. Uh, so I, I did go to Harvard. I am a National Science Foundation fellow. I have been interviewed on NPR and on MSNBC and other TV shows and other radio shows and other podcasts. I've published scientific papers, I've published in business journals. And so I, on paper, seem really impressive. But at the same time, I scored in the fifth percentile when I took the physics GRE. I took three physics classes as an undergrad and got like a C minus in all of them. So when I applied for graduate school, I felt woefully underprepared to do astronomy or physics. I was rejected from half of the grad schools that I applied to. I still get really confused and anxious anytime I see a phi uh, <laughs> on paper. Like I see that symbol and I feel like my brain shuts off. Uh, and I've had several professors in undergrad tell me that I wasn't ready, I wasn't qualified, I wasn't going to make it in grad school or in academia. And so I feel like an imposter. Every time I walk into my office, every time I walk into an academic setting, I feel like I don't belong there, and I feel like everyone else in the room is much more qualified to be there than I am, despite all of the stuff that I started this talk with. Uh, and I'm not the only one who experiences that. Uh, I know I'm not, because I have met other human beings, and I've done the research to go into this talk, so I know how prevalent this is. Uh, but, but I wanted to start there. Uh, so I have just told you that I feel like an imposter, and I want to know if you feel like an imposter, because you are not. Like, that's, that's the main takeaway from this workshop. You are definitely not an imposter, but the important thing is whether or not you feel like an imposter. Uh, so I have a few questions that I'm going to ask you. Uh, I'll go through them one by one, and I want you to mark every time you answer yes to this question. At, at the other side, so you got that? We're gonna mark yes every time we answer yes to one of these questions. Can I get a thumbs up or something? Cool, great. Uh, so the first question, oh, do you feel like an imposter is the important thing. The first question is, do you often attribute your success to luck? Do you feel like you have uh, achieved all you have? Do you feel like you are where you are today because you got lucky? Uh, if, you say yes, then, then mark a tally or a check mark or something. Give you some time to think about it. Look back uh, through your mind's timeline and think about how lucky you think you are. This is on the links you sent us from earlier? Uh, n yes, this is, uh, but the question in the first link is actually going to be how many times you answered yes. Okay, so this, these takes are just on our own, not on your own. own. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, I'll let you know when you have to answer all of the links I sent you. At the other sites, do you have computers? Do you have access to the links that I sent? I see nods. That's good. Thank you. Uh, the second question is, do you think you've tricked people into thinking that you're smarter than you really are? Do you feel like the people around you uh, don't know that you're secretly an idiot? <laughs> Are you laughing because that's just so ridiculous or because it's so true? <laughs> there you go. All right, moving on to question number three. 
Do you feel like you can't possibly live up to other people's expectations of you? Do you feel like other people expect way more than you're possibly able to do? Do you feel like you'll never be able to achieve as much as other people think you can? Do you feel like the people who hired slash accepted you to whatever position you currently have made a mistake? Do you feel like you're here just because someone else picked up the wrong slip of paper or accidentally sent you that, accepted, that acceptance email when they meant to send it to someone else? Okay. Question five, do you feel like you should have accomplished more by now? Do you feel like you're somehow lagging behind the, the grand plan that you set out for yourself or that anyone else set out for you. Question number six, do you have a hard time accepting compliments when someone says, hey, you did a really great job or hey, you uh, look really nice today or whatever it is, do you get really uncomfortable? Do you have a hard time knowing what to say back? And the final question is, do you feel like everyone around you is smarter than you? Do you feel like you're the dumbest person in the room wherever you go or most places you go? All right, so those are all the questions. Uh, these are actually taken and paraphrased from an actual imposter phenomenon test by the woman who coined the term imposter phenomenon. Uh, her name is uh, Pauline Clance, Dr. Pauline Clance. And I'll link to that actual test at the end. But for now, I want you to count up how many times you said yes. And I want you to go to that first link, that first Google link, and tell me how many times you said yes. Moya? Yeah. Sorry, Charlottesville here. We didn't actually receive the links from Lindell. OK. Um, well, I. Can't really send them to you now, but we <laughs> you can you can put in your information later. Um, okay. Actually, I will have to send them to you. I can forward them the email. That would be great. Yeah. Uh, do you have Lindell's or Anya's contact information? I have Lindell's. Uh, okay. Oh, no, Robert. <laughs> Robert will will forward the links to you. Um, okay. Lindell's not here. Oh. Uh, uh, I, I will do it. I will, I will, this is live problem solving right here. Uh, but everyone who does have the link, uh, go to that link and answer the questions. And then I am going to hopefully find the results. Yes, this is really hard. <laughs> I'm going to go to my, my Google. You're going to see all my information here on the screen. I see nothing. It's Prime Day. Good. It is. It is Prime Day. That's a, that's exciting, I guess. Um, okay. So here I have the the responses. Uh, can you all see this this bar graph? Yeah. Uh, so the vast majority of people who answered this said yes to five of those questions. So five out of the seven, they said yes, they do experience these symptoms of imposter phenomenon. I'm going to take a, a quick break just to forward this stuff to Anya. Um, Anya, what's your, I don't even have Anya's address. Anya, can you, um, yeah, go ahead. A4E at nrao.edu. Okay. Thanks. Yep. All right, send it. That should go through. Uh, so is this what you expected? No. No? What did you expect? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought, I thought everybody would have a lot less than five. Really? Yeah. Okay. Is that because you had fewer than five? No, I have more than five. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, this is another thing about imposter syndrome. Like you, you know that you have all of these different symptoms, but you feel like other people can't possibly be as imposter -y as you are. So even if you answered yes to seven or six or five of the questions, you feel like other people may have only answered yes to like one or two. Um, but this is one of the most powerful things about having a workshop like this. You can see how 
impostery other people feel. Uh, so you can, the people who didn't have these, these links before, you can uh, put your answers in and then I'll send out all of this information later. Uh, but I'm gonna move on. Uh, so we all, most of us, uh, I guess I didn't put zero as one of the options, uh, but most people <laughs> said that they experienced at least one of these symptoms of imposter phenomenon. Many people said that they experienced five or more. Uh, so we all feel like imposters in this room. That sucks, but hopefully by the end of this workshop, you'll have ways to combat those feelings. Uh, but first, I want to give you a, a little bit of background information about what imposter phenomenon is, uh, where it comes from, why it happens, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you may have heard the term imposter syndrome. Uh, some people feel like that's uh, not the best term to use, and so some people prefer imposter phenomenon. Uh, I might use them interchangeably throughout this talk. Um, but in all of the slides, it says imposter phenomenon. So what is imposter phenomenon? It's a psychological pattern of feeling like you're a fraud, of feeling like uh, you aren't as great as everyone thinks you are. Uh, it is not actually recognized as a psychological disorder by the American Psychological Association. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's not actually recognized as a disorder, but it is closely associated with other disorders like depression and anxiety. Uh, and a lot of psychologists uh, spend a lot of time treating people for imposter phenomenon, even though it's not in the DSM. Uh, this first coined this term in 1978 in a paper by doctors Pauline Clance and Susanna Imes. Uh, that original study was actually really cool. I have a link to the original paper later on uh, in the presentation. But they studied 150 really successful women. A lot of them were uh, students, PhD students, who had received top marks in all of their classes and had been told by their professors and recommended by their professors for their academic excellence. A lot of them were also working professional women who had been given accolades by their employers uh, and by other people, well-respected people in their fields. Uh, some of these women were in individual counseling with either Dr. Clance or Dr. Imes, and others were in group counseling sessions. Uh, but the one thing that all of these women had in common, aside from the fact that they were really cool and really successful, was that they all felt like they weren't cool and weren't successful, and they thought that they were really stupid. Uh, so doctors Clance and Imes tried to figure out why that was the case, what was leading them to feel like they were frauds in their respective workplaces, and they found a few causes, uh, which I'll talk about later. Uh, but since 1978, this has been a pretty popular topic of study. I did a really cursory Google search just to see how many papers have been published with these words in them. And imposter phenomenon uh, and imposter syndrome, you know, they've been studied thousands of times. Uh, in thousands of different studies and articles, at least they've been referenced thousands of different times. And since then, people have studied imposter phenomenon, not just in women, but in, uh, you know, among groups of men, people of color, people with disabilities, people with different socioeconomic statuses. They've tried to study this phenomenon uh, along as many different axes as they possibly can to see uh, who is more susceptible to this, what is really the root cause of this phenomenon, uh, what can we do to stop it. That's it. Any questions here? Any questions from the other sites? Um, Moya, your email still hasn't come through, sorry. Um, I've just sent you an email from my NRAO email when you've got time later. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I sent it to the Go Astro. Oh, okay. Um, I'm gonna try and Robert, can you forward these to Anya? Okay. Um, it's really hard to like email live while you're giving a talk. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Just, uh, <laughs> right. I mean, maybe I don't know. How, I don't know how familiar I guess more the statistical information regarding it is. Like, mm -hmm. do do you see that more women are affected by it or more? people of race or yeah this this has been uh, this has changed a little as people study it more and as people get more open-minded about what they should be studying the original study was all about women uh, I saw a few articles come out fairly recently like in the in the teens uh, about men actually getting more imposter phenomenon than women uh, that's just it 
It just said, okay, Anya. It just sent. It said previous, it sent. The previous one just sent. Great, thank you. Cool. Uh, so it's, it's flipped and flopped, uh, but I'll, I'll, in the next, no, in a couple of slides, talk about who, who uh, is more susceptible to it than others or what can make you more vulnerable to it. So what causes imposter phenomenon? Uh, if it is so widespread, if it's been studied so much, hopefully we know what causes it by now. Uh, in the original study, it said that those 150 women, one of a few of the common links between them were that they had kind of stressful uh, young lives. Uh, their parents put a lot of high expectations on them. They had older, or they had other siblings who their parents openly said were the bright one or the successful one or like the fast one or whatever. Uh, and also a lot of uh, stereotype threat went into uh, causing these women's imposter phenomenon. Who here has heard of stereotype threat? Anyone on the other sites? Raise your hand if you've heard of stereotype threat. Okay. A few people. Uh, so stereotype threat is this idea that if you belong, if you have a marginalized identity, especially one that has negative stereotypes associated with it, then you are thinking about those stereotypes as you move through the world. Uh, so some stereotypes that affect women are that women are worse at math or women are bad drivers. And so if you uh, are doing a task that is associated with one of those stereotypes, you'll actually perform worse because you're spending cognitive energy thinking about those stereotypes, trying to not confirm those stereotypes, trying to uh, not worry about the fact that you might be seen as a representative of whatever group you belong to. Uh, and so these women in the original study, they were performing worse, they were having worse feelings because of stereotype threat. Uh, but since then, those that those explanations have become more broad. Uh, and so most people agree that imposter phenomenon isn't biological. Uh, it's not brought on by chemical imbalances in your brain. It's brought on by environment. And so there are a lot of things in your environment that can happen to you, that can you know, be foisted upon you that will make you feel these things. Uh, if you have an unsupportive environment, if you have an advisor who doesn't know how to praise you correctly, if you have a parent who isn't very supportive and who will openly tell you that your sibling is smarter than you are, that's going to lead to imposter thoughts. If you are in a situation where people have unrealistic expectations for you, including yourself, uh, if you expect that you're always going to get A pluses or you're going to run a mile in four minutes or you know, whatever task you're trying to achieve, if you set unrealistic expectations for yourself or if others do, then you'll experience imposter thoughts. Uh, a lot of change can do this. So if you think back to the times that uh, you may have experienced really strong imposter thoughts, definitely when I think back to those times, it was when I started college or when I started grad school or when I started an internship. Anytime I started a new thing and I was put in a new environment, that really uh, made my imposter phenomenon worse uh, because you have to deal with you leave behind all of the success and all of the rapport and all of the accolades that you've built up in your old environments and you have to start fresh wherever you end up going uh, and that can be really stressful also being the only person being uh, the only person of color or the only woman or uh, being what you perceive as the poorest person in the room. Uh, if you are in environments where there aren't a lot of other people that you can closely identify with, that's going to lead to imposter thoughts uh, because of the stereotype threat, but also because you look like an imposter. Uh, you actually physically look like you do not belong in that space because you look different or act different from everyone else who is already there. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Other sites? Great. Not great. This sucks, but it's the truth. <laughs> uh, this is also closely tied to anxiety and depression, which makes sense because all of these other environmental factors are also closely tied to anxiety and depression. And unfortunately for us, I assume you're all astro students. Uh, raise your hand quickly if you're an undergrad. All of you. Okay. Great. Uh, so most of you are, are uh, undergrads or grad students. Uh, and unfortunately, our community has a very close tie to unhealthy uh, mental states, things like anxiety and depression. So this is from a report that came out last year that showed that uh, 
especially in, it showed that grad students have uh, really high rates of anxiety and depression, I think more than six times higher than the national average. And so if you put a bunch of people who already are more at risk for anxiety and depression, and you put them in these really unsupportive environments, they're going to get imposter phenomenon. They're going to have imposter syndrome. Does that make sense? Any questions? Cool. So if this is what causes imposter phenomenon, then who is going to get it? Uh, well, first of all, almost everyone gets it. Uh, a, a really old study, not really old, an oldish study from 1985 said that about 70% of people have imposter phenomenon or will report imposter thoughts. Uh, and so, yeah, that's 70% of people who are self-reporting that they feel like imposters, but this study is old and people lie. So I'm sure that there are more people who aren't reporting imposter thoughts. And then everyone left who genuinely doesn't feel like an imposter, then I, I want to know what confidence pill they're taking. Because I have, I don't think I've ever met anyone who doesn't feel like an imposter unless they're like a Kennedy, I don't know. Um, so it's really prevalent, which is bad, but it can also be really comforting. You can take solace in the fact that you aren't alone and that everyone else around you, you can pretty safely assume that they feel like an imposter too. Uh, it's more common in people with marginalized identities. We've talked about that. And it's more common in people who have already achieved a lot of success, which is pretty counterintuitive. Uh, but imposter phenomenon creates this cycle where if you achieve something, then other people's expectations of you increase. Uh, sometimes you can't live up to those expectations, and then you, you feel like an imposter. And it's this really vicious cycle. Uh, it's pretty unstable. Um, this is a, a fun comic that I found uh, where the, the woman who is the world's leading expert in imposter syndrome starts to say something as if she has imposter syndrome and then catches herself. So even the most successful person who studies this very phenomenon experiences it herself. Uh, there are a lot of other successful people that you may have heard of who, who experience imposter phenomenon. Uh, Maya Angelou, I have some quotes from them. Maya Angelou said, I have written 11 books, but each time I think, uh-oh, they're going to find out now. I've run a game on everybody, and they're going to find me out. So Maya Angelou, one of the best writers of the 20th century, feels like an imposter and feels like she doesn't belong and feels like she's not as good as people think she is. Have you ever read Maya Angelou? She's amazing. <laughs> like, of course, of course she's really talented, and of course she deserves all of the success that she's achieved and more. Uh, Tom Hanks also feels like an imposter. He said, there comes a point where you think, how did I get here? When are they going to discover that I am, in fact, a fraud and take everything away from me? Even Michelle Obama, queen, uh, feels like an imposter. Uh, she said in an interview uh, for her book with BBC, I still have a little imposter syndrome. It never goes away. That feeling that you shouldn't take me seriously. What do I know? Uh, well, she's Michelle Obama, so I think she knows a lot, but she doesn't feel like she knows a lot. And so this shows you how common this really is, even in the most successful people that you look up to. Any questions? Questions at the other sites? Word. OK. How does imposter phenomenon affect your life? but can uh, materialize in a few different ways. Uh, Dr. Valerie Young uh, studied imposter syndrome, has a pretty great TED talk about imposter syndrome, and she separated it into five different types of imposters. Of course, you know this isn't mutually exclusive. You might identify with multiple types of imposter, but this is how she laid it out. Uh, so the first one is a perfectionist. You feel like a failure if you make any sort of mistake. Uh, if you get an A, if you get like a 96% on a test instead of 102, you're a failure. Uh, the next type is the expert. I'm a failure if I don't know everything. Uh, if someone ever asks me a question and I don't know the answer, then I'm a failure and I don't deserve to be where I am. Uh, the third one, this, this one is really me, this one hits close to home. I'm a failure if I can't do everything by myself. If I ever need help, then obviously I don't deserve to be where I am. The fourth is a natural genius. Uh, I'm a failure if I ever have to work for something. If it doesn't come naturally to me, then I 
I'm horrible, like I'm, I'm a fraud. Uh, the fifth is the super person. I'm a failure if I can't do it all. Uh, this is especially bad among women who are told this narrative of like, you can have it all, you can be a mom and a professional woman and a model and like a car spokesperson, like you can do everything. <laughs> Uh, and a super person will feel like if they can't actually do all of those things, then they have failed themselves and everyone around them. Uh, so imposter syndrome can do a lot of really wacky things and it depends on which type of imposter you are and it depends on the environment you're in because some of them are, are opposites of each other. It could lead you to either procrastinate or overwork. Uh, it could lead you to refuse help, settle for less than you actually deserve. Uh, there are a lot of other things that imposter syndrome can lead you to do. Uh, and if you do those things consistently, then you end up in a worse place in life. You end up with worse jobs, lower pay, uh, you're more stressed, which then feeds into this cycle of imposter phenomenon. Uh, and so these are all really horrible consequences of experiencing imposter phenomenon and not confronting it and not uh, working with yourself to alleviate the symptoms of your imposter phenomenon. So what I want everyone to do now is open up that second link that I sent you. Open up that second link and I want you to think about a real way that imposter phenomenon has affected you, a real way that it has held you back in life. I put in a few examples. Um, every single time I go to do a talk and they ask me what my fee is, I like cut it in half every single time. Uh, and if you ever work in an industry where you have to negotiate your salary, this is going to bite you in the butt. Like, this is not something you want to go into negotiations with, right? Uh, hmm? Already on the same yeah, everyone's writing on the same document. And this way, um, especially because, <laughs> oh, I want to see what people are doing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> <not chaotic. laughs> so I'm chaotic right now. No, I said I called you bully Yeah, we're not anonymous. We saw. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> anonymous Nine Cat, we see you. That's who I am. That's who you are. You're a Nine Cat like you. It'll tell you who you are in the little. Oh, no, I lied. Yeah, and this way, uh, you can always go back to this document uh, if you feel yourself slipping into this again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, are they all writing on it too? Yeah, everyone is writing on it. I'm just going to the next page, guys. I'm just going to wait a second. I'm just going to the next page. I've been trying to go to the next page, Donovan. It's not working. <laughs> I don't know about you. I'm going to the next page. I am here. Okay. Come on. Come on. Okay. So these are all. Okay. Great. Oh, I can, can I second? How come I'm not getting any bullets? You have to start. You have to go all the way to the top. Yeah. You gotta go everybody's fighting. Yeah. Yeah. If you hit, if you hit enter off a bullet point, it'll continue. It'll start with the bullet. But if you just randomly pick a spot. It's I'm learning in real time the difficulty of asking like 20 people to <laughs> edit a Google Doc. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I love that people are going through and, and you know, kind of yeah, seconding so what people say. That's awesome. OK. Uh, so you can see that you have been affected by imposter phenomenon. Other people uh, have been affected by imposter phenomenon. And you can always go back to this document if you fear feel yourself slipping into these old habits. Uh, if you're ever about to go into a job interview and you have to tell someone what your salary should be, you have to negotiate for your salary, look at this document uh, and it'll remind you to actually give a number that you are worth. Okay. Uh, and now the, the really important part of the workshop, how do you fight imposter phenomenon? Uh, we all have it, we know where it comes from, we know that we are particularly susceptible to it because of the environment that we all share. Uh, and we know how it affects our lives, but how can we stop it from affecting our lives? I came up with a little acronym that I think is particularly appropriate for this group, STAR. Uh, and when you feel yourself slipping into imposter phenomenon, you can, you can make like a, a starfish uh, if you are the type of person who believes in like power poses. and and whatnot. Uh, but I have four steps that you can take to stop, your felt, stop yourself from uh, experiencing really bad imposter syndrome. 
uh, before, even before STAR, a lot of people say that just educating yourself about imposter phenomenon is enough to stop it. And for some people that is enough, but not for everyone. A couple of weeks ago, I was sitting in my office and I experienced the worst imposter phenomenon spiral that I've had in years. Uh, I'm about to start the fourth year of my grad school program. And so it's been a while since I started a, a new thing, since I put myself in a new situation. And this was, this was really horrible. And uh, I don't know what set it off, but I remember distinctly feeling uh, or thinking to myself, that I knew it was imposter phenomenon, I knew it wasn't rational, I knew that I should stop, but I couldn't. Uh, and so being able to put a name to it isn't always enough, and so I want to give you other tools in case you are in a situation where it's not enough. So the first is to set realistic goals for yourself. Uh, whatever you're trying to achieve, be reasonable. Uh, you, you have the power to set your own expectations. And if you set realistic expectations, then you won't be disappointed with yourself later. Uh, and so I want you all to take a moment. There's not a Google Doc for this, but I want you all to take a moment uh, to redefine for yourself what it means to be successful. Uh, if you are in this program and you're doing research, I, I don't want you to think that in order to be successful, you have to write a first author paper that gets published in science, because that's not realistic. Uh, for everyone in this, like, if this is your first research experience or if you're an undergrad, that's not realistic. Uh, but maybe a more realistic goal for you is to learn something new every week or to pick up a new skill every day or something. Uh, but whatever that is for you, take a moment to think about it so that you can go forward with that in mind. I'm trying to see if anyone has really obvious thinking faces, but they don't. <laughs> the next one is to talk about it. One of the horrible things about imposter syndrome is that it makes you keep things a secret. Uh, and if you keep things a secret, if you keep things in the dark, then no one is ever going to be able to help you with your imposter phenomenon. Uh, so there are two things that you can talk about. There are many things. Uh, there are two things that I've specifically said you can talk about here. You can talk about your failures. Because if you ever fail at something and you don't tell people about it and other people haven't told you about their failures, then you feel like your failure is the only one and you feel like your failure is the worst one. Uh, and so I want everyone to go to this third link, this third Google link that I've sent out, and I want you to share some of your, fail some of your recent failures. Um, that way you can look at the ways that other people have failed and maybe you won't feel so bad. <laughs> Whoever created is creating the bullet points is yeah. a thinky person. They're the real hero. hero. A yeah, a true hero. That's what people had more spaces. <laughs> That's okay. Years. Everybody can pick a bullet point now though. Are there enough bullet points? There's like 30 bullet points. There's there you enough. Go. And I don't want this to be a thing that gets used today and then never gets used again. Uh, there is a pretty good number of people here and you can make yourselves a community. You can make yourselves a community where you share your failures uh, and this way you, know, you have a list of other people who are smart and brilliant and successful because they got into their own research programs and they have failed in all of these ways. And so if you continue to add your failures to this list, every time you experience one, then not only will you be helping other people, but you'll be helping yourself because you can see all of the past failures. Why do you to like disappointments? I feel like okay. failed is a sad, deep, dark word. That's the point though. Uh, but yeah. It reinforces the idea that it's a failure. <laughs> uh, but the, the whole thing is that everyone does fail at different points in their life. Uh, and we don't have to think of failure as the worst thing that could ever happen. We can think of failure as a starting point for you know, standing back up and trying again, or uh, maybe recreating yourself uh, in, a, in a different way. But yeah, we can, we can change it. What have you failed at recently? Slash, how have you been pointed? 
There we go. All right. There we go. Yeah, and this this can be really harsh. This can be really hard to look at. Uh, I know when I was making that first slide of my presentation, and I was just like staring in the face of my some of my biggest failures. I felt really bad about myself, but if you can look at this list that other people have also added to, and you can see that other people are also confronting their biggest disappointments, uh, then maybe that will make you feel better. share that you can talk about is your successes. Uh, one way that imposter phenomenon will manifest is that it will make you feel weird about telling people the really cool stuff you've done. It will make you feel like you're bragging. It will make you feel like other people will then question whether or not you actually deserved that success. Uh, and so as a result, I know I definitely do this, I, I have stopped telling my friends when I travel or when I get cool speaking gigs or when I publish a paper. I submitted a paper for publication a month ago and didn't tell my best friends because I didn't want them to feel like I was bragging and I didn't want them to question whether or not I actually should have published my results so soon. Uh, so I want to give you all a space to share your successes with the same people who know about your failures and your disappointments. Uh, it's going to keep you honest, not that I think you're all lying, but um, it'll give you a space to amplify your own awesomeness. And it'll give you a place to maybe be inspired by other people's awesomeness. You can support one another. Um, I know that these are different programs. There's NAC, there's Astrocom. Is that what this is? Yeah, Astrocom. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. OK, uh, so I know that there are, are different groups here. You're spread around the country, too, but um, this is the power of the internet. You can uh, connect with each other in this, in this way. And so hopefully people are having just as much success filling in their accomplishments. Yes, successes yes. is link number four. Having a whole chat. These are awesome. Whoever just negotiated for a better salary, I'd like to talk to you so we can <laughs> so we can share tips. <laughs> Really just me getting all of your tips. Credit card APR though. That is that is that yeah. is a success. You, you deserve all the gold stars for that. <laughs> These are awesome. All right. Yeah. Congratulations to all of you on your successes. This is really good to see. Does it, does it help to see your successes kind of listed out in one place? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Uh, another kind of like very practical bonus of this exercise is that uh, it'll help you with your CV. How many of you have a CV or have uh, started working on a CV? The other sites, how many of you have CVs? Yeah, so doing things like this, uh, regularly thinking about ways that you've succeeded or uh, things that you've accomplished, those are the things that you should be putting on your CV. These are the things that you should be bragging about and you know announcing to the world on a piece of paper that maybe no one will ever read. But it's still important because you have to include it in applications. Um, so yeah, that's a, a practical outcome of this. <laughs> how does this step feel? Uh, how does it feel to share your failures? 
And the other sites, you can turn on your microphones if you have feelings about sharing your failures. Anyone? They don't want to talk to you. Hmm? How do you feel, how does it feel to like say to a group of people you know and also people you don't know, hey, this is a way that I have failed. This is a way that I've been really disappointed lately. Well, freeing. Freeing? Yeah. Okay. Great. Why why was it freeing? Because nobody knows I'm feeling it. <laughs> okay. Everybody knows. Yeah, yeah, now everyone knows. What about at the other sites? How did it feel to share your failures with some strangers and some people who you know pretty well at this point? I just like the person at the top. That's my failure. I deleted. Oh, okay. I actually deleted the top. I'm not. I'm not. We're we can hear you. Okay. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> How did it feel to share your failures? Oh, it's kind of nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Were you? It's nice. It just. It was stressful. It's stressful, but it's nice to know that you're not the only one who's done something. Okay. Good. It feels good. Same. Uh, it's nice to feel like you don't have to keep hiding it. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that's the whole point of this Google Doc that hopefully people continue to edit. What about your successes? Did it feel weird to share your successes at all? Yes. Yeah? yeah? I couldn't think of any at first. You couldn't think of any? And then did you eventually think of some? Yeah, then I had like three or four. Yeah, yeah. There, there's like a delayed reaction where at first you're like, have I succeeded at anything? And then once you get those juices flowing, you realize that you've succeeded at a lot in life. This cool? What about the other sites? How did it feel to show your successes? Feels like your success might not be a, might not seem like a success to someone else. Oh, so you felt a little apprehensive about sharing that as a success? Did anyone else feel that way? Yeah, yeah I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. But when you were reading through the list here, did you think that anyone else's success was not that impressive? Did anyone feel that way? Nah, it's pretty, pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, I know you're not going to raise your hand and be the jerk who's like, other people aren't impressive. <laughs> but <laughs> but you, can, you can think in your mind uh, whether or not, like how impressive you think all of these people are. Uh, and the fact that you are on the same level as all of these other people who are sharing their successes and their failures, I think that that can be freeing after the initial apprehension, definitely. Anything else? Any other? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> to some extent, mm -hmm. sharing successes is beneficial, but like if I think like getting a C in my quantum course is my biggest success, mm -hmm. and someone comes in here and says I got an A in my quantum course, mm -hmm. then I no longer feel successful. Okay. I'm not taking quantum. This is a <laughs> okay. But congrats to whoever said they got an A in quantum. That's the bomb.com. But, like, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I definitely get that. And it and just reinforces the imposterness yeah. that you feel. And that's, that's, the, that's where the importance of setting your own goals and redefining success for yourself comes in. Uh, because for you, if getting a C is a success, and for me it definitely would have been, but I never took quantum because I was too afraid. Uh, for me it definitely would have been a success to get a C, and if I remain steadfast in my own definition of success, then seeing that uh, can still be helpful, seeing that another person got an A can still be helpful. Uh, but yeah, it's hard. It's hard to keep that mindset. Does anyone, yeah. Sorry. I also thinking that um, uh, actually sharing my failures to me is risky. Okay. Do you want to elaborate on that? So I think that depends on experiences that you've had, but yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. I mean, this isn't compulsory. You should only share what you are absolutely comfortable sharing. Um, but I did want to provide the space for people to share if they wanted to. Um, does anyone else feel like they are really uncomfortable sharing their failures? I have a question. No. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I assume people can hear me. Yeah, yes. I'm all the way yes. out there on the, yes, yes, there I am. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think it's a really good experiment here because what you're doing is actually facilitating an environment where where people seem to allow themselves to let down the shields on their vulnerabilities and the failures mm -hmm. and be able to kind of admit failure in unison. And I'm almost feeling like this is <laughs> this is like a gathering that should happen on a monthly basis in every single institute where people should get together and admit that they have failed. Yeah, do you, I, do you I, have any experience in that? Like, is that something that people have tried? I haven't done that personally in person, but I was inspired by a few different Twitter threads that I've seen where people have shared like a failure CV, uh, where instead of a CV of all of the internships they've been accepted to and all of the papers they've published and everything else that makes them a rock star, they have a CV of all of the things they've failed at. And I've seen a few of those circulating, and I wanted to make it possible for you to do that in a communal way. Uh, but yeah, if, if you have the space to do this in person, then I definitely encourage that. Cool. I hope that's laughter and not tears. Um, okay. All right. Um, the, the fourth. The fourth thing that uh, you can do, is there something really funny on the success list? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you gotta be prepared to look at it. Oh, what is, what, what is, what's happening? Look at it, it's a <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Fantastic. Someone should screenshot that. <laughs> um, okay, so, the, so the fourth thing that you can do to combat imposter syndrome is actually preventative. Uh, and so this, is, this isn't after you failed at something. This is something that you can do way before uh, so that if you feel like you're in an imposter spiral, you can take out this thing, and hopefully it'll make you feel better. Uh, so this is, uh, I want you to remember a time when you were feeling yourself. I want you to make a feeling yourself packet. So some things that can go in this packet are pictures of you when you look particularly fly, or uh, letters of recommendation that you read them and you're like, this person thinks I'm that? Or um, you know, other screenshots of successes, a drawing that you were particularly proud of, anything that you look at or you experience and it makes you like feel yourself, feel good about yourself, put those in one place. Uh, a place that you can access pretty easily. And then when you feel yourself spiraling down into the deep, dark imposter syndrome thoughts, you can take out this packet uh, and hopefully it will remind you of all of the times that you have been really successful. Um, and it'll help bring you out of that darkness uh, by reminding yourself that you did at one point feel like a rock star. Uh, because the only times you put something in this packet are when you feel like a rock star. Does that make sense? Okay, so I want everyone right now, there's no Google Doc, but right now I want everyone to think of the first item that they would include in their packet. And then maybe when you go home, or if it's an electronic thing, you can start to assemble that packet with this first item that you've thought of. Uh, for me, uh, my Feel in Myself packet is actually a letter from Tierra. Uh, the first thing I put in it was a letter from Tierra that she wrote. Tierra's at one of the other sites for people who are in this room. Uh, Tierra Wave. That's, that's, that's her. That's you can't her. see me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so on my birthday, Tierra wrote me a really nice letter. Uh, and in it, she complimented me a lot and she made me feel really good about myself. And when I was done, I didn't feel like taking a picture because I was ugly crying, but I did feel 
just like really confident. Uh, and so things like that can go in your feeling yourself packet. Also, this picture of Zendaya can go in your feeling yourself packet because she's great. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really whatever you want. So those are, are my four steps to overcoming imposter phenomenon and feeling like a star, uh, which is how you can remember it. It's to set realistic goals, talk about your successes and failures, ask, oh, I completely skipped over A, ask for what you need. My bad. This is a really hard one. Uh, this is something that I did earlier this year with my advisor where I sat down with my advisor and I told him the types of interactions that I need. I said, this is how often I want to meet with you. This is the type of feedback that I'm open to. Uh, this is how, this is the feedback that I will respond best to and the, and the type of feedback that I'll respond best to. Uh, and so this is really hard to first think about what you need and think about what will make you a healthy person and then to ask for that from those around you. Uh, but it, it can have really great benefits. Since then, my advisor and I have had a much healthier relationship. Uh, I've also done this with friends and family, uh, partners, these types of interactions that can otherwise be very harmful if they're putting unrealistic expectations on you or uh, putting you down or not praising you in the way that you need to be praised uh, or acknowledged. This can overcome that if you put the work into it. Because this, I think this is actually the hardest step, is asking for what you need. All right, so those are my four steps uh, to overcoming imposter phenomenon and making yourself feel like a star. I have other uh, materials that you can read or look at uh, at your own leisure, but uh, that's all I have. I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions and other people's tips, because I am not an expert in imposter phenomenon, except for the fact that I have felt like an imposter for 20 years. Uh, but all of you are also that level of expert. So um, that's all I have. Thanks for coming to the workshop. Hopefully. Uh, does, does anyone have questions? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Cool. 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 How do you know what you need? That is a great question. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I turned off the microphone. Uh, so when I was figuring out what I needed, I looked at past interactions that I had had with my advisor and tried to pinpoint where things went wrong. And so for me specifically, I realized that when my advisor just like pops into my office without warning, uh, and when we haven't scheduled a meeting, that really made me feel bad and made me feel like I wasn't trusted to do my own work. Um, other things like the, the way that he would just change my documents uh, he would go in and edit our, our paper without telling me, um, even when it was like a stylistic edit, which I really didn't appreciate. And so I, I told him what I wanted him to do in those situations. I also made the document view only. <laughs> so, then, so then he physically could not edit our, our documents. Um, but yeah, it, it was a matter of looking at what had bothered me in the past and what had triggered imposter syndrome for me in the past, and then telling the responsible party not to do that anymore. Does anyone have other things to add to that? No? Did that, uh, does that seem like wait, something you can do? Uh, oh, hello. Yeah. <laughs> hello. Hi. Um, like bouncing off of that, so it seems like he wasn't very like he wouldn't take your changes. So like it seemed like you had to make things like view only. Like, is there a way to actually be able to change someone else's behavior without like kind of like because you were essentially kind of changing your own by like saying view. I just want to know is there a way to be like make someone else if you recognize it as a bad behavior? Like, yeah, I that's that came when I asked him not to do things anymore. Um, and so I did tell him that I didn't want him just coming into my office whenever he wanted, and he stopped doing that. Uh, 
I told him how often I wanted to meet with him and that I wanted to be the person to initiate meetings. And so he backed off and waited for me to approach him instead of him coming to me, uh, which made me feel a lot more trusted. And so at the end of the day, you can't control another person. All you can do is tell them what you need and try and make it very clear to them that like, this is really important to you. Uh, and if they're a good person, then hopefully they'll do their best to give you what you need. If they are not doing that, if they're not respecting your wishes, then that's a sign that it's an unhealthy relationship. And if you can extract yourself from it, then you should try. Thank you. Yeah, I know that's not like a magic bullet, but that's because there is no magic bullet for this. Anything else? Yeah. What about uh, for something that would be like the opposite situation uh, where the mentor is a lot more hands off and the student is uh, either like afraid or embarrassed to approach for help, what do you do then? Yeah, uh, I've, I've done this in the past because I'm a soloist, that's my imposter type. So I, if I do have a really hands off advisor, I am not the, I'm like the last person to go to that advisor and ask for help. Um, if you know that about yourself, then it's, it's going to be difficult, but what you can do is set norms at the beginning of your relationship. When you first start the research project, tell your advisor, uh, this is how often I would like to meet with you. Um, and there will be times when I won't want to come to you because I feel like I'm stuck and I, I don't want to admit that I need help. Um, another thing you can do is find someone that you are very comfortable with, find someone that you do trust a lot and ask them to do things on your behalf. Uh, so if, even if you're not very close to your research advisor, if there's a person who's in charge of the entire program or um, you know, a postdoc somewhere, someone that is kind of secondarily associated with the project, um, then you can ask them to Help. You can ask them for help if you're more comfortable going to them than the advisor, or you can ask them to approach the advisor for you. Um, yeah, these things are difficult. And every single time I've been in that situation, I've left very sweaty, mm -hmm. but uh, sometimes it's necessary. Any other questions from the other sites or comments? Uh, I'm. I'm sure everyone is open to hearing others' tips for uh, combating imposter phenomenon. How about here? What have you done? Say that again. Uh, what have you done aside from what I've named to combat imposter phenomenon? Because my list is not the end all be all. Yeah. Well, definitely for me, um, I've always had found, whatever, found people that I trust very much, whether that's professors, advisors, coworkers, mm -hmm. and um, then for what, then it's just like, I'm very open, right. you know, and so that with, with, within that more intimate relationship, I'm very, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so. Uh, what's your name? Anna. Anna. Uh, so Anna suggests hopefully you're able to find people that you are very comfortable with and that you trust a lot. Um, and maybe that should be your priority when you enter a new environment. Uh, making sure that you find people that you trust uh, will make things a lot easier down the road. Great. Anything else? So, um, what I found that's helped me. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Um, I found if I can, like, help other people, like, whether it be in classes or just, like, um, like, totally unrelated stuff, um, if I can help someone else learn, it makes me feel more confident about, like, what I know and just the ability to help someone else. I, like just that in itself makes me feel a lot better. Like yeah. if I help someone, then I must be doing something right. 
That's awesome. Yeah, that's that can be really powerful. Uh, and to build on top of that, because you mentioned helping people with things that are, are kind of unrelated to what it is you're doing, if you can build up small wins, uh, if you can put yourself in situations where you know you will succeed, um, then that will help build your confidence. Sometimes when I'm making my to-do list for the day, I put things on like, answer this email. Uh, when I'm having a really bad day, the to-do the to -do list is like, put on pants, right? But like, even building those small wins uh, shows me that I, I can get things done and that helps me build my confidence. Uh, great, great idea. Anything else? Uh, I have a question. So uh, a lot of times when I, um, the barrier to me initiating um, a conversation about like feelings of imposter syndrome is I feel like I'm just like shamelessly asking for um, like fishing for compliments. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I don't know how to start a conversation about it without it like going in that direction. Because a lot of times when I do tell people like I feel like I am an imposter, uh, they'll take it as an opportunity to tell me how great that they think that I am, uh, whereas that is not always helpful. Okay. Uh, so what would you want in that scenario if not someone telling you that you're awesome? Um, I think it would be helpful, just like uh, how we, um, what we just had, like talking about um, having them share that if they had similar um, experiences would be really helpful. Okay. Um, uh, or so offering if, <laughs> solutions. Right. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so if, if that's what you know you need, then maybe you can enter the conversation looking for that specifically. Uh, so maybe instead of telling someone, I, I'm feeling unconfident or I'm feeling like an imposter, you can ask them to share their own insecurities which which you know might be equally uncomfortable um but you can also form relationships with your friends or coworkers or whatever where you you establish a set of norms where if one of you goes to the other and says hey i'm feeling like an imposter then the other person knows what you need in return uh or i've heard of uh relationships where uh they, they've explicitly talked about it beforehand to, so that they know what the other person needs. Uh, so I, I have one friend who, whenever she goes to her partner and says that she's feeling like an imposter, her partner will uh, fight it with facts and fight it with not necessarily compliments because it's not all like, you're so pretty, you're so great, but it's specific examples of uh, things that show that the imposter syndrome, that the imposter thoughts are irrational. Uh, so developing that relationship with someone uh, might be really beneficial for you and others. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that feel really hard to do? Um, yeah. <laughs> I feel like if, if you find the right person who you like trust enough, um, but also who you feel like you're close enough with that you can reasonably expect that from them, um, yeah. that would be really helpful. Yeah. One thing that uh, has always struck me is that when I go to my partner who is not an academic and I tell him how I feel about that I feel like I can't do astronomy well, it doesn't matter what he says, I'm not going to feel better because he is not an astronomer and so I, I feel like he's going to think that I'm impressive no matter what, even if it's wrong. And so uh, finding someone else who can feel like an imposter in the same way that you feel like an imposter uh, can can help. So maybe that's where you should start looking or where anyone could start looking for that type of relationship. Moya, well, yeah, I just want to connect to what you were saying about, you know, sort of finding evidence for something. It's mm -hmm. a strategy that I have found works really well for me. Um, because I work in project management, it's like, black or white. So, you know, I say to myself, well, you know, if this is what you're thinking, then you need to be able to produce, like, evidence that, you know, to support why you're saying you're an imposter or why you feel that way. And if yeah. I can't 
you know, sort of provide like an email telling me I suck or, you know, a conversation with somebody saying, oh, that project took too long or went, you know, then, then I'm actually just lying to myself. And that's, you know, that's me in, in imposter syndrome. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a really great way to look at it. You, I mean, the people here are all scientists or we exist in an academic realm. Uh, and so in almost every other part of our lives, we won't believe something unless it comes with evidence. Maybe you can start using that same lens to view your own imposter thoughts. Um, yeah. sometimes, sometimes when so I, from, I came from an, an all women's college and like mm -hmm. everyone talks about imposter syndrome there and it's like yeah. you can't there's like a what's like a like a there's a depth to the imposter syndrome like someone will think that they're the, the most impostery of the imposters and there's almost nothing you can do to say to them to like convince them otherwise uh -huh. what are like strategies for helping people like see that yeah um, so doctors Clance and Imes or Dr. Clance when she coined the term imposter syndrome imposter phenomenon she also made a test uh, to tell how much of an imposter you are and so you can take that test it's 20 questions uh, to see like how many symptoms of imposter syndrome you get which is one way of attacking this but I feel like you meant the other way like feeling like more of an imposter means that they are less qualified, not that they have more imposter symptoms. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, when people come to me with that, I just give them evidence for how I'm worse. Uh, so sometimes people, sometimes people will come to me and they're like, oh, I totally bombed the physics GRE. Like, I'm not going to get into grad school and I don't know any physics at all. And I'm like, oh, really? Well, I got in the fifth percentile. Like, are you part of the 4% of people who scored worse than me? I don't think so. Um, and I still got into grad school. So, uh, so yes, if, if you're comfortable enough with it, and if you have that type of evidence, or if you know someone who has that type of evidence, feel free to tell everyone you know that I got, in, they scored in the fifth percentile. You can tell, you can spread it around. Uh, but if, if you're comfortable with that, if you're comfortable with sharing your own failures, then that can help other people. I've seen that. Uh, I don't have any other tricks to get people to believe that they are not the dumbest person in the room. Does anyone else have other tricks? Yeah, I mean, a lot of good things have come from me scoring that abysmal grade. Yeah. Uh, yeah? Who's the um, like, have you, have you seen this exist in other places? Because you've talked mostly about academia, but um, have you, like, seen anything about, like, in industry, people discussing this as well? Yeah, I definitely saw those results. Uh, I didn't include them here, but they, they exist. It's, it's sometimes worse in academia and the because of the connection with anxiety and depression the percentages can be higher here but it is also really common in every other industry i mean the the number that people cite is that 70 percent of people have experienced imposter phenomenon in their lives and it's not like 70 percent of people are academics so uh, people in industry are definitely feeling this but i don't have the the citations for you Yeah. Any other questions? Any other last minute tips? No? Other sites? Do you have any last last thoughts? I have yeah. one. <laughs> Great. Um one of the one of the points where I experience imposter syndrome is when I'm in a gathering with, with many people and especially when, if someone, well, if someone seems to know it all or has a certain way of expressing uh, him or herself, uh, it gives me that, then that's, uh, that's a, like, it's a benchmark for me. Okay, this is happening now. I'm feeling the imposter syndrome. Uh, but I was wondering like if there are 
suggestions slash guidelines to how to execute meetings and how to actually execute uh, gatherings of colleagues and so on in a way that does not facilitate yeah. Uh, the generation of imposter syndrome, if you if you understand what I meant with that. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Do you have first yeah, thoughts? I was, I was just no. This is this is a really good. Oh, so like if you look at children, mm -hmm. earlier than a certain grade, I would say most second grade, they're all like, I can do anything. Oh my god! <laughs> and then by the time they're in fifth grade, seventy-five percent of them think they're dumb. So like, what is it that we're doing? And this goes off of that. Like, what is it that we're doing mm -hmm. that generates this? Yeah. Um, I haven't thought about this question before, but my my first thoughts would be um, because we know that imposter phenomenon comes from an unsupportive environment or comes from you know people around you not treating you the way that you need to be treated. Uh, I would say that a pretty easy way, a pretty like superficial way to at least m minimize the, the amount of imposter syndrome that people would feel in a meeting would be to set norms for that meeting beforehand. Um, so it's make explicit rules about how people should show that they agree with something or understand something. Because I know that sometimes when I'm sitting in a talk and people are just like nodding along, I feel really stupid because I definitely don't understand what the speaker is saying, but other people are nodding along. Uh, but I've since realized that other people sometimes nod along because they've, they've been told to either fake it, yeah, or, it, or it's a tick, or they're trying to make the speaker feel more comfortable. Like that's something that people do. And so setting up explicit guidelines for how people should act in those situations uh, could help a lot. Um, I don't have any other thoughts aside from the fact that that's a really great thing that people should be thinking more about. <laughs> and in my research, I didn't find anything, I didn't find any research that people had done around this specific question. It would be interesting to test it, setting yeah, up definitely. a meeting at some point and test some things, yeah. Yeah be a really interesting experiment. Okay. Um, I want to respect everyone's time. Uh, I think we have the room for like 10 more minutes, maybe. But any last words? Um, I, have a, I have something. Great. I think one thing that's been really helpful with me in the past is when um, my mentors and advisors are very open about um, mistakes they've made or like ways they've failed or um, even one thing that my advisor at my home institution does that's super helpful is when she's writing an email, she will like allow her full train of thought to go on in the email, which sometimes makes them really long. But <laughs> one thing that's really helpful is that we get to see all of her ideas that didn't work. And she'll say like, I think we should do this. Uh, maybe actually, I don't think it's gonna work because of that. And so we get to see that she doesn't always have like the right answer the first time every time. Um, and that, that's very reassuring. Definitely. Yeah, so the people who are supervising us or advising us, they have a lot of power to affect our imposter phenomenon as students and as advisees. Um, so like letting your advisors know that they do have that power uh, can really change your environment and can change the amount of imposter phenomenon that you experience. All right. I think that I didn't see anyone else with their hands up. So that's that's all I have to say. Um, I hope you continue to use those Google Docs. Uh, hopefully that community will help you feel better about sharing both your failures and your successes. And if you want to try and do it in person sometime with your uh, various sites, um, I'd, I'd encourage that too. That's a really great suggestion. That person. Yeah. Um, are you going to share with us this PowerPoint? So yes. Some of the links. Thank you. Yes. I will be sharing the slides with you. Um, and so you'll have access to the links and the information on, on the in the presentation. 
Um, and I will try and send it out to the right people this time so everyone gets it. All right, I think that's all I have. Thanks again for coming. Thank you.